Hope y'all are having a beautiful Monday morning. Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. And since it is Monday, we are diving back into behind the scenes of the fantasy football industry with the third and final member and co-owner and co-host of the Fantasy Footballers. We have Mike the Hitman Wright. Now, you guys have uh, pretty much made up, I think, 30% of, of my uh, my interview series so far so I'm not really sure I'm not really sure what I'm gonna do after this I might have to uh, might have to ask Brooks to come on or see who's someone else on, on your team that can that can join me on Skype and whatnot thank you for coming on I know my audience is definitely looking forward to this one uh, we got a lot of good uh, stuff on the agenda today so uh, say what's up to the people what's going on now are we are we the big dogs or are they the big dogs or is everybody? It, the big dog. So it, it's it's really just the the brand. We're all we're all big dogs, and it's in a business sense, I guess. It's it's more so, uh, not to be cliche, but like work hard, play hard, right? It, it's more of a going out there and putting yourself out there and wanting more out of life. And if you do that, you know you're gonna eat. So that's that's kind of what what the brand stands for in my eyes. Now your brand is is uh, one that I'm aspiring to get to in terms of the level of of audience and the size and the success that you guys have had this year. Um, now, you know, like what are the first thoughts when you think back on 2018, like new year's Eve hit, you know, 2019, and you're looking back um, just uh, appreciative of, of all the things that came your way. Like what emotions, what thoughts kind of uh, come to your mind first? Ooh. So entering this year, uh, I mean, the emotions are definitely still frequently of disbelief that, that this is actually a, a full-time gig for us. I mean, and we're coming up on uh, this is year five, so this this will this will be our fifth year, you know, at working at full time, which is madness for for where we have gotten to be able to support three families. And I mean, the guys have talked about it. We're we all got three kids. We have big families. We got some employees, and we're we're living our best life, man. I I feel like. I don't really work, but and it's it, it, it's a weird thing because you work a lot, but you it's that's you know, the old cliche of you. I've, I've never worked a day in my life, but <laughs> yeah, but you don't feel you you don't feel drained the way that you you can with other jobs. Like you'll look at the clock and go, "Holy crap, it's five! I guess I got to get out of here." Instead of you're looking at the clock, it's two p.m. Just just wishing and praying that the clock would hit five so you can get out of there. Yeah, and that's a it's kind of a beautiful segue into my question because I don't think I've ever really like gone through with with either uh, Andy or Jason who had previously come on for this interview series. What your guys is like typical day looks like because I know you know ninety nine percent of people in the world or in America or whatever um, your demographic is would love to have your job, and I know one hundred percent of my audience definitely would love to have your job. So, right. you know, what does, I, I know you say you don't get like, you know, it's not the same feeling, but there are absolutely times where I, I personally feel a little bit burnt out because, you know, a lot of time and work goes into this. So I, I was kind of curious, like, what does your typical day look like uh, Monday through Friday or if you're working Saturday and Sunday, uh, how many hours and like, what's your, you know, what's, what's the setup there for you? Sure. So it's, it's different depending on what time of the year it is. I mean, like it, we're in off season, which we consider this is our dev time. So everything right now is working on the draft kit. Got some new things coming out with it with the for the UDK, like the new big thing this year. Working on an app, so that takes up a, a, a lot of time. Just getting in there, finessing some things. And right now, for me, I'm on a lot of rookie stuff mm -hmm. because in the NFL season, that's everything I'm doing. You know, I I don't have I don't know how guys are doing NFL and college at the exact same time. That's, Me either. that's absolutely my boy. And then, and then there's like season. there's like the Devi Devi teams. I'm just like, yeah, you guys, you guys are yeah, out of control. Like high school guys. Yeah, I'm like, what? A four star recruit. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that, like, that's, it's like nah. That's crazy. Nah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wag the Matumbo. That, like, Exa oh, exactly. Oh. Not up in here. Because uh, in season, it's uh, the only day off is Saturday, and you're and you're talking in the office, 8 a.m. on Monday. Record immediately. Get the show out. Go home leave the office usually around five and then then there's a monday night football game same thing for thursday and then on sundays i am the the live streamer we've got it worked out because i have my church has service on saturday so i get to go to that and which leaves me 
free on Sunday morning, so I'm the I'm the designated stream man. Okay. While the uh, while the guys are at their service, so Sunday I come in, uh, probably about the same, about about 8 a.m. and get get all prepped up, get those last second rankings going, and then and prep the live stream. Me and Brooks are here, mm-hmm. but now, I mean, now I don't have to work Sundays during the off season, so that's pretty cool. I actually <laughs> get that day back. Yeah. Uh, but it's still a uh, we still get in around eight. Yeah, usually uh, we're a little bit more lenient in the off season because we're all we all put on the uh, fantasy football pounds. <laughs> I yeah, I did. I, I saw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but generally speaking, when you're when you got the sixty hours, seventy hours, whatever it is during the season, your workout regimen and your eating kind of goes in the garbage. And so you, your waist size grows a bit. So, so right now we're trying to sh- shrink. You know, players, <laughs> players in the off season are bulking up because then they lose weight during the season. We are the complete opposite. I just keep getting fatter. So <laughs> That's funny. I got drained in. Uh, so you know we're in nine and and still it's still work till about five o'clock. Okay. But, yeah. So pretty typical hours, and it's you know it, it's tough because like well it's not tough. I, I mean it's it's fortunate because I'm someone who. Um, I don't like to work the nine to five. I do end up working most days end up being like a nine to five kind of thing. But, uh, there are some days that I don't work like that. There are some days where I'll work from like noon to eight or I'll work from 8am to 9pm. You know what I mean? So it's kind of, it's crazy how things work out like that. And when you're talking about during the season, it gets tough during the season because you're on such a tight time schedule. Now I have a question like, because this is something I've struggled with. How many fantasy leagues do you play in? During the regular season, uh, so I am in, I think usually five or six leagues, but the, the leagues I actually get the time, it's maybe three of them, three to four. Yeah, that's a that's such a problem I've had. Like every year, you know, I'm sure you get a million invites into leagues and stuff like that, yeah. and it's always like, oh no, you know what? I'm trying to cut down my leagues because it's like my high school friends, my college friends some of my subscriber leagues and like all that stuff. And before you know it, I'm in like nine leagues. And I was like, oh, last year I said I was going to cut down and somehow I added three more. So staying on top of that is like a, is like a job in itself because you want to do well in those leagues. But at the same time, you're doing your research and you're creating content and, you know, like it, it becomes two different jobs in one. And it's like this, this isn't fun anymore running these fantasy teams. Yeah. And then Tuesday night hits and you go, oh, dude, oh, the worst. Oh, no. I haven't done any waiver stuff for three leagues. Yep. And, uh, like, sorry, wife, I gotta, I gotta go put some waiver claims in. There is was... for for me. That's how I know. That's how I know I'm in too many leagues. Is <laughs> yes. <laughs> when I dread doing a waiver situation, running through everything, I'm like, okay, I got, I got too many leagues. Yeah. So I guess like waiver wire Wednesday or wait, Tuesday night is basically like our Sunday scaries in a sense. It's like we get right. really, really nervous and I'm like, oh, 11 p.m. hits and I'm like, shit, I didn't make any moves on the wire. And like, hopefully I'm in Yahoo where it to- tells me all the leagues that I haven't picked a certain player up in and I can go in and grab that guy. But uh, yeah, that's just something I've, I've kind of struggled with throughout the season just because your content schedule is on such a, like a time crunch. Now, yeah. Um, con- like during the season, you know pretty much like what your content is going to be, right? You can only do a certain amount of things throughout one week of NFL season. Now, you- when you guys are planning your content throughout the off season, though, right? There's so much flexibility in terms of the content that you want to put out there. How do you do? You guys have a meeting in like I don't know January or something and plan out exactly what pieces of content are going to come, what days, and things like that. Yeah, we do. We we sit down. We have a production meeting. Usually map out. Of at least a month and and the way we do that you know we we have well a couple seasons worth now where we look back what show worked what show didn't what do and what was the feedback on this one what do people actually want to hear about and what do we yep. want to talk about because we, we need to actually care yeah and be ready to talk about it it's it the harder thing is like the rookies you know because hardcore dynasty people which our show is not necessarily a hardcore dynasty we're definitely a redraft show but there are we're more and more into dynasty. And I think that fantasy football players as a whole are slowly starting to trickle into dynasty. Definitely. But people are ready to talk about rookies in January, but we aren't. So yeah. we're, we're trying to push them, <laughs> delay that as long as we can. So we can actually be educated and not just like, yeah, that Josh Jacobs. Huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's, I hear he's good. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel the same way. Sometimes it's like, 
when you're trying to plan content out, it, it's it's really difficult to decipher like what you know you feel is right, but like at the same time, what's good from like a business perspective. Because I know one thing that has definitely held me back in the last couple like summers, because that's when you know when the growth is exponential is not taking advantage of, you know, like YouTube is my main platform, obviously. So like titles and SEO and things like that are absolutely crucial to it. Whereas like, yeah, that's, that's big in podcasting, but I feel like at this point it's a lot more maybe word of mouth. And if you're, you know, if you do rank at the top, like three or four spots, like you guys and, you know, fantasy pros or whatever, like, yeah, you're going to get a lot of organic growth, but if you're down the sides of that, it's tough, but YouTube, you can be found on the search on the side or whatever. And that was something I struggled with. So what I actually did very recently was I went on to um, like five or six of the biggest channels on YouTube, like you guys and, you know, a few of the other smaller ones. And I went back like during the summer to see like which videos performed the best and at which time were they released and, you know, how were the view counts and things like that, just to kind of get a grasp on like what I did wrong, what I should be doing going forward. And then it's a fine line between like, do I even want to give out that content? Because like you said, you don't want to like push yourself to do something that you're not even like enjoying creating the content for because the first of all the audience is going to know that like in a second they're going to be like okay like this is bullshit this is not why we came here right this is not this is not the hitman stuff that that we have in line you know um right. so it, you know it, it's a fine line there but i would say you know that's uh that's a good piece of advice for people trying to start out like go to other people's channels maybe people that you in- inspire to be or people that you look up to and see what worked for them what didn't and kind of take off that. And it's not like you're stealing their ideas because your, your content is going to be completely different, but, um, that's an avenue to go by. And, you know, segueing into, um, something that I've found to be like ridiculously important that I had no real idea about prior to like getting into a business mindset with things. You talked about how you have a production meeting and you plan for at least a month out. And I'd imagine a lot of media companies or production companies probably plan at like a quarter of a time, right? Like Q1, Q2 and things like that. Right. Um, so I, I really believe that in, in today's world, actually, this is probably just a business thing in general, like the difference between a good small business and a, a massive scalable business is the systems that you have in place, right? Because you're doing everything manually, manually, manually. And once you put a good system in place where you know exactly what to expect, that's when you can start scaling up because you don't have to worry about all the in between the trenches kind of stuff. So I'm interested to hear um, like how, how many like systems do you have in place? Like what, what, what do you guys have going on behind the scenes that a lot of people probably aren't aware of? Sure. So like, I mean, everything is scheduled out. So like, for example, social media, you know, we have our, uh, our, our tweet doc, so to speak, where we have our, our Google, we have a spreadsheet going and Brooks handles, most of the stuff on the the main account at least when it comes to posting Mm -hmm. usually if if you get a reply or something from the main account that's almost always me but we have we have our rotation of okay this is the this is the stuff that we're pushing right now this is you you want to let make sure that people are engaged because it's funny where you get to this point where you feel like man we're we're pushing like the draft you're like well we have to push it every single show and that's just how people work, man. So sometimes, yeah. sometimes people need to hear something 20 times before they go, okay, fine. I'll go, I'll go and check it out. I know. Uh, so you got to make sure that you're just, you're staying on your message. So our, th- that's an example of our, our social media doc where we, what was, when was the last time we tweeted out about this partner? You know, it, it was a week ago. Okay. We're good. We don't have to do that for another couple of days. So we, we try to streamline things as much as possible. I think Andy had talked about it, but we uh, are very much, we, we guide our business after the 80, 20 principle. Right. Uh, so like we strongly filter almost every single decision through like, does that, does that make sense for us? 80, 20, are we going to put too much in and get no return from this? So, we, we make sure things are as efficient as we can possibly make them. Right. Okay. So you you guys actually are a little bit more flexible with that stuff than I had imagined. Like, it, say, okay, you have a, a podcast coming out, right? Like, do you have uh, an exact checklist of things that you need? Like, it's like, okay, Brooks is going to upload this to YouTube, and then someone's going to tweet this out as soon as it goes out, and then we're also going to have a tweet six hours later, and then twenty four hours later of that content. Like, do you have a very specific system or schedule in place with like that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah, and then okay. we we use uh, Buffer, 
that helps a lot for people if you've never heard of it. Buffer is a is a a way to like pre-do all of your social media mm-hmm. and schedule when you want at, when things to actually go out on your platforms. Yeah, Buffer is a cool tool. I use that. I'm only on like the free plan because I don't I don't use it that often. Um, but you can link up like one or two accounts with the free plan and then schedule all your posts up front. So I, I'm yeah. you know I'm starting to get more into uh, having like a really really strict schedule. And I made like a whole Excel sheet for. Um, someone that I brought on to the team to help me with organic social media posting because I don't really have time to do that anymore, but I still obviously want to promote all the stuff that I have. So I'll literally have like a a seven column sheet where it's like content type. It's like, and then there'll be like a word count because Instagram can only do 2000 words or whatever. So if you write something in there, it'll count the words. And if it's over 2000, you have to take it back. Like I think it's getting very, very precise with exactly what you need to do. Cause if you don't have those things in place, it's really hard to scale because things can get messy very, very, very quickly. Um, so I was, I was, yeah, I was very interested in, in the kind of knowing what systems uh, you had in the back end. Cause I, I read, I read a lot about that and like everyone that's like a common theme through like almost every successful business. So, um, now you talked about your, the UDK, the ultimate draft kit. That is, uh, that is like, that's like your baby, right? That's like your, yep, that's your, the baby, man. That's the, uh, that was the, the digital product that really changed everything for the business where, and that was a funny, I don't know if you've heard that backstory, but that decision, uh, it was after, I think the first season is, so we, we get through the season, you know, like this is working out guys. We got, uh, we got some advertising dollars and things coming in, but how can we make this actually secure? And of course, if, if you're a strong business, you realize that you want, you want to be on the right side of the product that's being sold. <laughs> uh, you want to own it. It's a lot better to own the product than, than to just be talking about one. Uh, but when we went through everything, we went through, uh, just different different products we could have made. Uh, we were almost fully convinced we were about to make a uh, just a cheat sheet, uh, just a cheat sheet app, and go forward with that. We were going to have to get out a, a small loan because we were going to need programmers and everything. Mm-hmm. And then it was, well, what if we just make a draft kit? And then so we started working through all that stuff. Both Jason and I are pretty decent when it comes to. Google Sheets and doing programmatic things on that back end. And we were able to hack together something we were, we were extremely proud of. I use hack because it's it's just funny. Like if people, if when programmers see what we've accomplished with the means that we took to get there, mm-hmm. it's always a pretty funny thing for them to see that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when we made that decision, it was that was that was huge for us as a business because it was we were extremely proud. It, was uh, pretty good, instantly successful, yeah. and we were able to grow from there. So we very, very happy that we, we made that decision to go with the UDK instead of the Cheat Sheet creator. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the Cheat Sheet probably would have worked out too, and uh, you could like eventually throw that in there if you needed to. But like, I... Uh, I- I I created a, a similar like product to you guys. I didn't even know that you guys had the UDK. I wasn't really in like the business mindset of what was going on in fantasy football, but I was like, I'm gonna make a magazine. And I like went on Google. I typed in like online create online magazine. I found a website called Flip Snack, and uh, and I just created it manually. And it was it was the most tedious, time consuming thing I've ever done in my life. But like I did it, and I learned so much from it. And like the amount of sales that came in from it, I was, I was like shocked by, and I was like, Oh my God, there's like something very real here. Um, so, and that was like a significant portion of my income that I made through like branding and the fantasy football content a couple of years back. And then since then it's obviously grown, but, uh, I, I, I don't know like how comfortable you guys are with sharing this information. I'm very like interested in knowing, and I know my audience probably would be, and I don't even know if this is like public information cause you guys are a company or whatever. Um, and I was reading an article, I believe it said like a third of your income comes through the company's revenue comes through advertising a third through, um, the draft kit and then yeah. a third through Patreon or something like that. Could yeah. you give us a, a ballpark number of, um, you know, what kind of revenue you guys pull in on a yearly? Sure. The, uh, the percentage is, and the percentages are actually pretty close to that. Uh, the the advertising deal we were able to get in this year, I think, skewed it a little heavier to to the ads, and you know, bigger brands are starting to to become more interested in in the product and being able to go work out 
our, our ad deal where we are in charge of our studio sponsor and, and segment deals and things like that. So I'd say the ad the ad deal is probably closer to closer to fifty percent now. Okay. And the the draft kits the draft kits sitting there around thirty five percent is what I would imagine it is. I haven't broken down the numbers recently. Okay. Um so, you know, in terms of like improving the content in, in your product and like the, uh, the draft kit every year, I know that like I'm always trying to add new things to it. Um, is that something that you guys do like at the beginning of each year, similar to how you sit down and say, hey, we're going to plan out the next month of content. Do you, do you have a sit down meeting for the draft kit and say like, these are the new things that we want to put into the draft kit or um, do you guys kind of stick to the staples? I know you have like Matt Harmon going and doing the reception perception, which is like an awesome, valuable piece of content that's like exclusive for the most part to, um, to the UDK, like, do you guys, are you guys always looking to put new segments and, and sections into the UDK? I would say it's, as long as it, we feel like it will actually return value, uh, for, for not all, not only the users, but we have to think about ourselves the, the time that we're going to go, we're going to put the money that we're actually going to invest into it. So we do, and we're, we're always trying to take at least, one to two steps forward with it. So that's why this year it's the app. And we were at a place where over, uh, when do we bring them in? August, September. So like right at the beginning of the season, it was, we were looking forward. What is the next year's draft kit going to be? And it was, I mean, the, the most requested things, the, the two, I should say, the two most requested things for the draft kit, people wanted an app version, understandably. Yeah. And and the, the one hindrance, I would say, of our draft kit versus versus some of our competitors would, was the custom scoring, and I mean we offered you know standard half point and full PPR which covers uh, what like 80, 80 to eighty five percent of leagues, but there's still those people that they really want to have custom, and we knew to get those things done we needed a programmer, so we found we we called up a good buddy of ours who used to work with us for uh, back when we did the games we mm-hmm. were doing the game company, and we're like. Can we steal you away from from your job? And luckily, things worked out. So we brought him in, and we've we've been getting the app going. So that's that's the two big steps for us this year. We're gonna have a, a full dedicated app that's free. It comes with it's just a a nice access portal for your draft kit. You know, wherever you are, making it look good, and then custom scoring will be available. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's a fantastic idea for you guys because I mean, I had the UDK last year, and the website is great. It's super smooth, but like. On mobile, like mobile doesn't really have the internet down that well yet. It's hard, man. Yeah. Getting that that amount of information into mobile is an extremely difficult thing. Yes, and it's just it, it's it's messy when you're on the phone too because the charts are big. They're too big that like when you try to yeah. shrink them down to mobile size, it looks awkward and weird. An app basically takes all that weirdness and awkwardness out and makes it extremely smooth. So I, like that's a I think that's a terrific idea for you guys. I'm sure that's going to be like wildly successful and people are really 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 gonna like that so that's um that's pretty awesome now i wanted to kind of switch gears and you've you've seen a lot of success thus far with the brand if you had to start over now this is more of like immediate next steps kind of thing i don't you know i don't want to hear like oh you know find your voice and and be yourself at this (laughs) or whatever and that's fine because i say that same stuff on my channel because it's the truth but say you guys woke up tomorrow and the fantasy footballers were not you know, uh, didn't have the audience that you guys had now. No one knew of you guys. What would be your first step in, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you would try to go after it again and, and you know how to work the market. What would be your first step, do you guys think, as a team to um, try to get back to the levels of success you have now? Oof. So I, I go through things for, um, I'm more of a content guy. Like my background is I'm a musician. Uh, I'm an entertainer. I uh, So... I here's a business pro business tip for for everyone. Not everyone is an elite business mind. <laughs> if you don't have that, don't you don't have to feel bad about it. Find someone who has that skill set. Like it's it's pretty rare that you find somebody who is, excels at every single aspect of life and business. And I mean, like I, I knew that was. You know, oh. <laughs> <laughs> <you know. laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but it was like. I know that Andy and Jason are monsters when it, when it comes to thinking about business. Like their brain thinks about things differently than mine does. So it was 
it was just this perfect match for all three of us because we have very unique skill sets. So I would say that's that's tip number one is if you're going to work with a team, make sure that your skill sets are complementary and you don't. Not everyone just does the same thing. Like for example, just a, a, a from my past, uh, I was in a band. And, I mean, forever I thought I would be this, you know playing arenas i was going to be a super world famous rock star bro you're getting and, there just not and, by music <laughs> right and as a band i mean we were very very good like so we were we were scouted by universal i took we took some meetings with their a and r but none of us had business background we just all three of us just wanted to play music and so everything eventually fell apart because no one was the driving force for the business mm. uh so that's why I'm super lucky to be involved with Jason and Andy because that's their wheelhouse. Yeah. Uh, but so coming at it from back to your question, the roundabout way of saying, I think the best decision that we made early is we were talking about, uh, one, we wanted our show to be for the mainstream. Like and that's often viewed as a dirty word, especially <laughs> when you, when you're looking at independent niche things. I mean, yeah. like look at like music. If you're mainstream, you're a sellout, man. You're not doing it for the art. Well, that's with- that's why you stopped, right? You didn't want to be a sellout. Yeah, exactly. You got it. <laughs> and it wasn't a complete failure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and the same is for fantasy football. I mean, there's tons of niches, and like when these guys like, and they do awesome, awesome stuff. But we knew we wanted ours to be for everyone. I mean, we wanted when we started, we wanted our competitors to be the networks, to be ESPN, to be CBS. And part of, uh, of getting it there is making this feel that's, that's for everyone, it's for mainstream, and yet you are still creating this super tight sense of community and that if you listen to this show, you're not just listening to a show. You are a part of this show. And, and so I remember early on for our first few episodes, you're like, I, th- I feel like the topic of inside jokes kind of came up. And we're talking about, you know, because if you do an inside joke, is it going to, is that uh, a deterrent for new people when they come in and they hear you talking about all these things? Like, I don't know what these guys are talking about. And I pushed really hard. I said, like, no, guys, like inside jokes are crucial to this because that's what friends do. Like, that's what a group does is uh, like new people. It takes a little bit. It takes a couple shows to catch on to certain things. Like, why do we? screamed the word 55 the way that we do in our show like absolute buffoons and for some people they don't even know but they still get in on it like it's, it's still really yeah. exciting for them i literally i like here in the back of my head right now 55 i'm like oh my god yeah. mike stop bro <laughs> <laughs> so i'm like no guys that's super super important yeah to me and then i i don't know if i had just been thinking about it or if just on the drive in i was reminded of jim rome and I might have been listening. I don't remember because I used to listen to him on occasion, but he called his listeners the clones and that started just, you know, ringing in the back of my head of, uh, of part of why Rome was so successful was people who listened to his show felt like they were in it. We're in it with Jim Rome. Like he's all, I mean, he's up on his pedestal, but we are still involved in that. And I'm, I was like, I just threw it up on the show that like, guys, we, what do you call people that listen to the show? I mean, we got to have a name for this. Yeah. And so, of course, I had my name, which was I called everyone the Foot Clan, and I wish we could find that episode because it was it was universally rejected by. <laughs> <laughs> but then the listeners came strong with the feedback on Twitter, and they're like, "That's well, a- I don't know, maybe maybe Mike knows what he's talking about on this one, so we'll just go with it." So I, I think that was a huge decision of the way that we wanted to guide the show yeah that's a i think i think that's a good name i like the foot clan a lot it's very it's not like it's not like you're trying too hard it fits in really well with what you're doing and you guys have all mentioned it um all three of you guys that have been on here have said like when you're listening to our show you're at the table with us like you're part of it and i always think like when people are starting out like if you're not being authentic to yourself like if you can't act the way on camera in your content that you would be acting while you're with your friends sitting on a couch or something like that, I don't think your content is going to succeed. 
you know, unless, unless your content is like strictly for informational purposes and it's like, you know, a very niche to a certain point or something like that. But I think in, in the long run, especially when you're doing with multiple people, if you can't sit at that table and pretend like the cameras aren't there and talk as if you would have talked like that, I think is going to be a, a really big hiccup for people starting out because people, you know, similar to your guys' backstory when, when the show first started out and the first few shows were very like uptight and you weren't sure how to really find your voice. And then when you finally let things go, that's when, you know, you saw the growth and you saw the engagement and things like that. So I think that's, you know, that's really important. That's always like a theme on, uh, on these, on these episodes. Now I I wanted to ask you, and it seems like you kind of answered that already because you guys are are very different in, in the sense of the skills and the traits that you bring to the table. Um, so you are the most creative, I would say there. Yeah, that's, I would say the, the most uh, was it right brained of the group. Sure, I'm going to agree with you. I don't, I'm not really sure, but for <laughs> for a while, like I, I consider myself a, now, I consider myself a creative person. When I first started, like I guess the whole I hate the the word entre- entrepreneur, but like entrepreneurial, you know, journey or whatever. Um, I was like, oh, I'm not I'm not creative at all. But for some reason, in my mind, I had the idea that being creative was the same thing as being like artistic. And my, my sister has all the, the art genes in my family. Thankfully, right. I, thankfully I took everything else. I took the looks and the athleticism and the smarts and things like that, but she can have the art. She has the art and that like was stuck in my head. And I was like, yeah, I'm not creative until I realized that like being creative was simply just that you're, you're creating things. They don't have to be artistic or anything like that. And I, that's such uh you know like you said there needs to be a business person um, like someone who does the math and the numbers and there needs to be the creative side and i think for the audience out there like you have to be self-aware enough to understand what you bring to the table you know not everyone's going to have both sides of that um and, and the the quicker you learn that and the quicker you could try to find someone that is a good counterpart to you the quicker you're going to have success cuz again that's almost like a system in itself is taking that work off of your plate that you're not good at. It's the 80, 20 rule. It's like, what, what is the 20% you're putting in on your side? That's going to give you the 80% of results. Um, so yeah, I was, I was, I was wondering who was the most creative. I had figured it was you, um, (laughs) because you kind of have this, just the creative look to you. And I knew you had the music background. Um, now a lot of creators, uh, people nowadays would probably call them hipsters. Um, sure. they, they have the, the sort of look that you have, and I don't mean to stereotype or anything. They have the tattoos yeah, going on. It doesn't bother me, man. Yeah. You're I figured right. like, why, why would it bother you? Honestly, at this point, <laughs> um, the, the tattoos now you are, you, what do you got going on over there? You have, you have both sleeves. You have any, like all you have in, all over the body too. I, uh, a lot of upper body. I got, um, sleeved up both my arms, both my ribs are done. And then the old, uh, the brand of death I have my neck is done okay okay yeah and I I love that I absolutely love that because that is just so not what people think of when they think of fantasy football you know like when they see you sitting at the table for the first time and they just see that arm full of tattoos it's like oh shit this is kind of cool like that will bring in a whole different audience itself just because you have that personal brand to you when did you start getting tattoos my 18th birthday. <laughs> there you so, go. There you go. Uh, so, which uh, could have gone better. <laughs> but uh, but I told my parents for, like, I've, I've always been, you know, interested in piercings. I had my tongue pierced for, um, you know, like five years or so. And, Jeez. and I had told my parents forever, which my, my dad's a pastor. My mom, they're, I mean, they're pretty conservative people. So I had to just, I had to break it down. Like, guys, this is happening. I'm going to get, <laughs> I'm going to get a tattoo on my 18th birthday. And why I say it could have gone better because I didn't have, I didn't have friends with tattoos. I didn't know people who had them. I just knew I, that I wanted to get one. So it was me weeding into the jungle of tat, the world of tattoos, having no idea what I'm doing. I get, uh, I found a, a coupon. <laughs> yeah, or like a local newspaper that was like 20 bucks off like, sweet that's where i'm going that's me yeah <laughs> and i walk in and they have if you're not familiar with tattoo places but they have art up all over the walls which like you usually refer to as flash and there was a tribal sun 
You just took it right off? I'm like, that one. (laughs) Put that on on my back. (laughs) That's funny. So so that that was my very, very first tattoo. And it took me a while before I actually had the proper friends who could point me to good artists. And actually, like, it, it blew my mind when they're like, no, you can tell the artist, like, exactly what you want. And they'll draw it. And they'll make, I'm like, Wait what? Wait what? I thought I had to pick it off the wall. Dude, that's the best. That's the best part about Instagram, man. Instagram has the most amazing <laughs> well, tattoo accounts. Instagram was not around when I was eight. <laughs> but now it is, so there's no more excuses. <laughs> tell, tell, tell Andy and tell Jason. Do they have any? Do they have any tattoos? Have you been trying to convince them to get them? They do not have any. Yeah. But and I think we were just like doing a uh, one of our Patreon shows, and that question came up is said to do Andy and Jason, and Jason said no, not yet. I'm like. Not Wait, yet. No. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> uh, Should get a microphone. I, I, don't think, I don't think they're, uh, you know, like opposed to getting them. They just haven't really sat down to think, do they actually want to get one? And, and that first one, I would think at this age, you know, the, the first one is going to seem pretty intimidating and scary. Uh, be like, That's there forever now. Yeah. In fact, you're 18. You're like. You just point at things. You're like, hey, put that on my body. <laughs> forever? Sure. Yeah. Who cares? What's Maybe. forever? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah, so like, you know, I, I my, the first tattoo I ever got was this, this like peace sign on my arm. It was actually from like a random, uh, a random Instagram account. And uh, I had, I was honestly, the, the, do not do this, people. I was kind of, <laughs> I was kind of drunk when I got it. And and ki- oh, that, yeah, don't do that. kinda is like a vicious understatement in the story too. Uh, me and my friends had gone into brunch uh, in New York. New York City has the absolute best brunch. It's bottomless margaritas for like five hours. But by the end of that night, we were in a tattoo shop, and we had met like a group of three or four people. They were in the tattoo shop with us getting tattoos. But my problem was I was still working in a corporate office at the time. So I wake up like a forearm is not necessarily a, like a low key tattoo, right? Especially right. when you're wearing like rolled up button downs or like a t-shirt or whatever. So I was, I was nervous. I was very nervous to go into work that next day. I didn't care personally. I'm not someone who's like, oh, tattoos are such a big deal. It's on your life forever. It, you know, it's like, I don't like, I don't care, whatever. It's what I wanted to do. You know what I mean? So like, had you had uh, uh, any jobs that like tattoos had become a problem or anything for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cause I did. <laughs> I mean, my, my career path, I, I've had one typical job with like job and that was about <laughs> two weeks when i was 16 years old i worked in office max okay and it it did not work out that was pre me. pre-tattoo mike <laughs> <laughs> right okay but then i after that it was it was all music going forward with my band i did I, i've done almost every job when it comes to music i've done i've played play, musicals for theater i've done producing i've done in studio musician work i mean that's how i made my living for for a really long time and then i went from that job to uh, I, I then i went to school for video game design and while i was still doing music stuff on the side and and then i went basically directly from there right to working for jason so i was doing their music for their their facebook and ios games and that was a culture that was what you would expect from a, a video game company they don't care if you I was going to say, if, if you're in a job where, like, even the slightest bit of, like, creativity is used, people love tattoos. That's, like, your that's like your key into that job, pretty much, I feel like. Right. I, I, I feel like things are actually kind of shifting on it. I mean, you go to, uh, go to yeah. Target. Go to Target and see the yeah. employees. They're often very tatted up. Yeah. And it's, if, we, if we've infiltrated Target. <laughs> we've made it. We did it, fam. <laughs> Tattoo fam, we made it. Yeah. <laughs> You know that the older generation, the, they're seeing the, like they're seeing people with tattoos everywhere. We're getting to the point where I think most tattoos are going to be acceptable. It's it's going to take a while for I would I would guess people with neck and hand neck hands and face. Yes, that's gonna that's a that's a whole new whole other barrier. Yeah, that the tattoo culture will have to break through. Yeah, I. Uh... It's before I, I started doing like content full time, I was working at a marketing agency in New York City and like they, the whole, uh, not even industry, just like job market overall, whether it's marketing or finance or whatever, they, in order to recruit the best talent, 
they are opening themselves up to be super, um, I guess, relatable to the to the millennials and the workforce coming in. So every marketing office you would go into, anywhere I interviewed at, had a full bar in its office, people with tattoos, like ping pong tables. And that's just the right. way that you're seeing a lot of jobs kind of shift. And it's like, if people want to express themselves this way, the companies are going to have to adapt or they're not going to get the best talent because, you know, the top talent yeah. still have other, everyone has different ways to express themselves. Tattoos happen to be one of them. So like, if you're not going to accept those people for whatever weird social stigma that you have against it, um, then those companies will probably have a hard time kind of continuing in the future. So uh, I was definitely just curious about your like tattoo experience because it, it's something that like, I, I feel like if we took the fantasy football analysts on Twitter and we combine them all together, they probably don't have as many tattoos as you do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. yeah, not really. I mean, it's it's me and uh, me and Daniel Dobb from ESPN. Okay. We're, we're very similar looking fellas. Both have <laughs> large beards and lots of tattoos. There you go. You categorize yourself. Just You're a large beard guy. Speaking of, I'm, uh, you, have you been to New York frequently or only for the, uh, like the live event you guys did last year? I, I've been there more than a handful of times. Okay. Have you ever been to Williamsburg in Brooklyn? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. This is a totally random point. I don't even know why I brought no it up. Worries. But I'm, I, 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 well, I'm moving there in like a couple of weeks. And it's like, oh, cool. it's known as like one of the, the hipster areas. And people have been telling me that I would fit in there for a long time. I don't really consider myself a hipster. But I was just going to say, I feel like you would very much enjoy that area. And I don't mean that in a negative way whatsoever, because I'm because I'm because I'm moving there, obviously. So, um, no, it's, it's, I would say it's, you have you have a beard and you have black friend glasses, so that exactly to a lot of people, they're like, "Oh, you're just a hipster." You're they're like, not even or, prescription; or, they're they're blue light. <laughs> That's how hipster I am. You're like, or I just look cool. Like, I feel like hipster is a word that people use where they're afraid to be cool, try new things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Try new clothes. Try new styles. Whatever. Yeah. You have like I, wore, I had this haircut in seventh grade. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm not changing. <laughs> exactly. Um, so you know, I this is uh, really quickly. I kind of wanted to just throw this in here. Now you went to uh, school. Did you finish college, undergraduate school? Yes, I have, I have a bachelor in game design. Okay, so you actually put that to use. Um, interesting. Did no, any? No, I mean, well, well, you well you did not for fantasy footballers, but prior to that, right, with the video yeah. game company. It's what's unfortunate and fortunate at the exact same time. And I was one of the very few success schools. I mean, I was at one of those for-profit schools. If I had the knowledge that I have now, I would tell myself, don't, don't go to that school. <laughs> but it was because of that school, you know, working through everything that I kind of formulated my path. I got about halfway through the school and knew I would never be able to hack it with people when it, when it came to visual arts, when it came to programming, I mean, I could do those things, but just not, I wasn't going to be able to do it well enough to compete in a hyper competitive job market. And I knew that I had the, I had the, the background in music. So it was okay. I'm going to focus on audio. So in, in then graduating and, and using their, uh, uh, advisors of, okay, well, what do I do now? It ended up pointing me to the meeting where I met Jason and then had a, a career making game audio for five years. So in that sense, it worked, but I would, I didn't really need to go to school yeah. to, to do the things that I did, but it got me to where I am today. So I can't complain about it too much. Yeah. I, it's weird. Like how I, how I think of college because nothing I learned in college is really relevant to what I'm doing today. And it's kind of sad to right. say, it's sad to say because you put so much time and you put so much money into it. And I, I don't want to tell people not to go, but you know, as as more companies and brands are growing because of like, and the way I see it is like, if you're a brand or a company nowadays, the way you pretty much grow is is through engaging content, right? And there will be some niches and industries that um, very expensive, I would say, that don't really necessarily need to put out content in order to have their clientele. But for the most part, in today's world, social media world, you need to be putting out content at a, at a rapid race. A rapid rate in order to in order to grow and so you're starting to see these colleges uh actually shift and have like i know my little cousin who's like a junior in high school wants to go to college for like video editing as her as her like major and, and things like that and i think it's pretty cool because 
They didn't really have it. I think it was probably right on the preface of me leaving college into uh, where like the younger demographic is now. Um, but it's cool because, you know, like you and myself are in in this whole like content creation, you know, circle. And now people, uh, you know, like we had to kind of create it for ourselves. You know what I mean? And now people are going to be kind of put on that path through college. So it's just interesting right. seeing um, the way that the world is shifting and college is finally grooving into like the, the way the world is, is moving. Yeah, for, for my kids, they it's going to be, you you take whatever path you need to take to. Yeah. But if you don't want to go to school, I'm, I'm doing that. But I'm going to recommend that all three of them at least go to business school. Go get your basic understanding in business and marketing. And then it doesn't matter what you want. Well, if you have those skills, like I said, where I, I don't have those. And I really wish that I did. I'm just very fortunate that I'm with two people who are fantastic at it. So if you get those skills and then be self-sufficient, yeah, well, that's what I'm going to recommend. And that's what I recommend to young people. If, if you don't want to go to school, I don't blame you. Just go to a community college and get uh, get your basics in business. Yeah, because the end result, what you were paying for for a long time was to get that piece of paper. I honestly think like yeah. what, what you will learn from Andy and Jason is a million times more than you would ever learn in a, in a business school. And I went, my undergrad is in international business. I got my MBA in, in uh, marketing analytics. And I still don't think I've learned anywhere near the amount of stuff I've learned just on my own doing stuff, you know? So it, it's tough to say, like, I, I don't necessarily want to point people to school and say it's the right path. But um, I don't know. It, it's just interesting seeing seeing how things are, are shaping up. Um, yeah, education of the future is going to be really, really interesting. Yeah, it because, is. I mean, not, not getting into, like, political conversation, but prices just keep going up and up, and more and more people are succeeding without college. So... Someone's gonna have to change something, dude. I think like I I feel like our the economy and I, I you know I'm not really old enough to have been hit by the economy in like '08, <clears throat> but we've been in a good economy for a long time, and right. if there's gonna be a reason for for it to crash, I feel like it's because of, of colleges and it, it's the absurd amount of money you have to take out as a loan and people are having so much trouble paying them back and it's at such a high scale and like you said they're raising it every every year and it's just. It's getting to to a point where it's just out of control and it's almost not worth it. Even if they were, even if you could pay the money up front and they can give you the certificate and you didn't have to spend your time there, it's almost not worth it in that sense. Craziness. Right. Um, so the video is starting to chop up. So I know that's when we're probably about hitting the hour, hour or so mark. And I know we kind of have to, I know we have to, that my timer is literally just my instincts on this one. And it's happened at the end for a few times, but we are getting to like with some of the final questions. I wanted to talk about the, the live tour ish thing that you guys, you know, have going on. Um, and I, and I said this to Andy, I was like, you guys are kind of like the modern day rock stars. If you think about it, because people listen to you as much as they listen to music now, and you guys are doing these live events. And I think he said, I forget the specific numbers of, of people that attended, but I'm assuming that you guys are going to be looking to, to up the, up the scale this time around. What, uh, what are you, what are you projecting for, for attendance? Yeah, so the, the the venues we're looking at now are more in the four to five hundred seat range, and we I think we have everything essentially locked down. We're saving everything for a big, all the the actual places we're going, the locations will be a big marketing push right around the NFL draft. So stay tuned. Uh, but we're going to uh, no a lot of new cities. I'll say I'll just I'll, I'll tease it with that a lot of new cities. But yeah, the the theaters we're looking at. Yeah, are definitely larger than they they were last time and it's dude it, the live events i mean that's the perfect merging of, dude, of my world that's it where yeah i get to do this i get to you know have fun and talk about mess around and talk about fantasy football but then i get that live aspect of of performing and entertaining that it, it definitely ups the ante of of the show when when you have 400 people you know, interacting and screaming and booing. And it's, it's wild, man. <laughs> but that it's makes you so up your wild. game naturally. I can't imagine yes. that's like, oh, that's perfect. so crazy. Uh, that's, that's wild. And that's, that's something that's, uh, that's definitely on my bucket list within the next few years. I would eventually like to do something like that. And, uh, dude, sh shout out to you guys for really paving the way on that kind of stuff. It's oh, really, really you, awesome. The, um, good, like we had our, you know, our proof of concept was two years ago. Just could we actually do this? Or we did the show in Phoenix, and we got we had a couple hundred people come out. It was okay, 
you know, we can do this. Yeah. And then it just happened to be our, our first show because we, we usually try to line our, our, our shows up with a trip we're already going to take. And last year it was the FSTA, which is the Fantasy Sports Trade Association, their summer conference was Minnesota, which unbeknownst to me and maybe a lot of your listeners, Minnesota people love fantasy football. And I'm talking like more than – more than you and I. They got a lot to look forward to there, man. They're they're not winning in real life. At least they got Thielen, Diggs, and Cook. Right, but it's just somehow it it, it happened where I don't know, maybe a lot of fantasy football started there. But uh, we were working uh, Paul Charchian, who's one of the godfathers of fantasy football. What we were lucky enough to have him kind of be our guest there. We were talking to him about, it and he said, "There's more fantasy players per square capita in Minnesota than anywhere else." And really. They've, you know, just all these surveys. So when when we went, I want to know out, who's running those surveys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, like, just the the eye test. You're camera. you're gonna be a film grinder right now. Test. You're film grinding. You're film grinding this. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, when when we got out, there, I mean, that was our biggest show mm-hmm. by far. I think I think four out of five of them or something sold out. If if they all didn't sell out, but that place was gnarly, man gnarly that's awesome the response as soon as we hit the button to start the show it's really funny you can go back and watch the youtube because both myself and jason almost start crying because we're so overwhelmed in in the the reaction this moment that's so awesome like it's a it's up there in one of my favorite memories of like i can think about it and get teary-eyed of it was it was absolutely wild. Yeah, I mean, you guys you guys deserve it, man. You've put in a lot of work and, and given a lot of value out to a lot of people, so I'm not surprised that it's worked out so well. Um, this this summer, that the FSTA meeting's in, is that in New York? It is in New York. Hell yeah. They've somehow let me into that, the FSWA, the Writers Association, All right. a, f- a few months All ago, right. so I'll, I'll probably show up. At, at, do you know where where it's at in New York, like location-wise? Uh, it's usually, usually in downtown New York. Okay. Uh, my my advice for you, so this would be another, yeah. you know, business tip 101. The FSTA has always, always been worth it for us to go, but it's crazy expensive. I mean, like, you, you, once, you, once you see the tickets and the membership, you're going to, your your face is going to go, what? Ooh. And so my I didn't, advice, okay. my advice for people who are just kind of starting out, the real magic to the conferences happens after the conference is over. It's all about the networking. It's all about going out. So if you can get an in with someone who's at the conference and knows where everyone is going to be, that would be just as valuable for you to go make the rounds, go to the, go to the club. Go to, not, we don't go to clubs. We go to bars. We go to restaurants and go to those. And, and that's where you're going to meet everybody and you're going to save – a lot of money by not going to the actual conference until you until your finances are at a place where you can yeah affordably or comfortably afford to go if yeah if i'm being honest i've like uh, this might sound bad but i have no interest in going to the actual conference itself i have no idea what it even in, in, i have no idea what it even in, like encompasses like what 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 goes on like what are you paying a ticket for i thought i got it i thought they were like let me in for free because i got into this thing now i have to pay but, FSWA and FST are two, are two separate entities. Mm. So the, the WA, they don't do any uh, live conferences anymore. Okay. That I know of. And the FSTA does their two. Oh, they're com- two. Compl- I thought, okay, I thought they were the same thing. One was just a trade no. show for the Writers Association. Nope. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I'm going to be in Brooklyn, and my I can get on a train and be in downtown Manhattan in, like, seven minutes. So I was figuring, like... You know, I could meet up with people, not that I have like a million people that I know in the industry, but I would much rather, like you said, meet up with people at like a bar or something afterwards and talk rather than be in there for the FSTA. I don't know if that's like looked down upon or whatnot because, no, you know, not at all. A lot okay. of people do it. Okay. So lot, maybe I'll do that. Do and, and totally, man, you're going to, I mean, you'll show up, we'll be there. So of course it'll be super awesome. <laughs> yeah. right but I mean, yeah, but you like Barry. Uh, Matthew Barry goes to every single one of these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, JJ, if you know the late round quarterback, he should be there. I mean, uh, I just hang out with Lord Reeves at the past one. I mean, it's, I just I just want to drink tequila with Brad Evans. That's really all I want to do. Brad, to be Evan, Brad Evans will be there. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, well, oh no, no. 
I take it back. He doesn't like New York. He does. He does not like New York. What an so idiot! He does, not, <laughs> he does not like New York. Well, there are there are things that Brad does with his life that New York does not allow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> no, Brad, Brad is Brad is hilarious because he is so genuine and authentic. The yeah. The person he is on the camera, where you're like, this is a personality. No, that's Brad Evans. Yeah, <laughs> dude. Brad Evans is the person. He, he was, is cool, man. I love Brad. Brad's the man. I uh, He was someone that like I really looked up to when I was younger. I thought he was awesome. And I find I harassed him on Twitter for I like. I saw you were you like were in Mexico or something, and you got him on the show. I did, yeah. Horrible internet connection in my room, but I was pounding margaritas because <laughs> I know that he would love that. And I was like, Brad, like I was. I, I remember I was asking him. I was like, Are you going to be in New York this summer? But he was busy when he when he had uh, had come around to New York. So I was hoping that he'd be there this time. But yeah, Brad was like, Yeah, he was someone that inspired me because he was so authentic to who he was. And it's like, dude, if he could do it, that's you know anyone could do that. So. He was something that inspired me. So yeah, I'll probably uh, okay around that time. Maybe I'll 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 hit you up and see uh, what your guys' plans for sure, are man. for the weekend and whatnot. Um, but that's pretty much gonna wrap up the interview. I do like to leave the audience with um, some kind of actionable advice. I know we kind of gave them a lot of value, and you did talk about um, what you would do, you know, if you had to start over. So that's pretty good. But if you had anything else to add on, um, just in terms of you know helping out the the younger group or Whatever, whatever you got going on there in your creative mind, let them know. Sure. So it's it kind of the the find your voice thing is uh, it gets beat into you, but it's it's difficult to understand and like how is how do I make actionable advice out of that? So my recommendation would be record five shows or or you know whatever it is, you know, articles. I'm I'm just coming from a podcasting background, so. If you want to do podcasts, record five shows. Make sure you're listening to each one. Of course, I mean when we when we first started that that whole the whole first two years, I would listen to every minute of every single show we did just to make sure wow we get better and all those things. But record. I mean, it's it's all about getting reps because it's easy to have a conversation, but as soon as you have headphones on and you're talking into a microphone, it just makes things weird. Yeah, you feel awkward. And it's all about getting the reps for you before you can be natural in front of a, a microphone. So that my advice of, of helping to find your voice is sit down, get the reps, record shows, understand you're going to trash those shows. They're not going to go out. No <laughs> one's going to hear them. You're going to be, you feel like you're doing all this work and then no one's going to hear it, but you're practicing. Yeah. So and, practice, and, practice, practice. Yeah, and by the way, like, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that do end up like leaving comments in my section. They're like, "Hey, I started a YouTube channel. Like, check out the video." If any of you guys do that, I will check out the video and give you constructive criticism. Not on all your videos, but I'll look at you know the first one that you put out and um, kind of give you any tips that I, that I see that you can improve upon that are pretty like glaringly obvious. And like you said, like finding your voice doesn't always need to be literally like you, you, you know your voice, your personality, but it, it's differentiating yourself in uh, in a number of different ways. It doesn't always have to just be your personality, but finding something that no one else has done. It doesn't need to be statistic based. It doesn't need to be on a podcast. It just, you really just got to think outside the box. And then once you think you found that thing, like he said, like rep, reps, 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 because yeah. once you start doing that, maybe you're like, Oh, you know what? I love this part of it. Let me see if I could transition it more so you know over there and whatnot so you know, once you start doing the only way you're going to learn is, is by starting to do and that's the only way you're going to start going down the right path i think so wonderful advice for the audience this was uh this was awesome talking to you mike i, I really really appreciate you coming on and your twitter hand your twitter handle has been linked underneath by your chest this entire time so guys obviously yeah, go yeah, follow him you if gotta, yeah you gotta you gotta link my ig i i suck at instagram i'm trying <laughs> to get better Okay. Me over there. Go follow him on Instagram, and we will link any of the uh, any of the stuff that he had spoke about down below. Is there anything else you would like to um, talk about that you got going on besides the the UDK or, or whatever? Uh, just the UDK, and, and uh, stay tuned for the live show, man. So uh, that's going to be the announcement's going to be big, and uh, the shows are absolutely incredible, and you better be coming to one of them. I will. I, I will be there in New York, man. As long as that's a 
putting you on the guest list though as Mr. Big Dog. You you better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not coming in if it's not on there. <laughs> Seat saved. Hell yeah. Mr. Big Dog. Front row. I'm gonna be barking at you. <laughs> All right, well, that's going to wrap up the episode, guys. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. And we'll see you on tomorrow's video, which I have no idea what it is. But thank you all for joining us. <laughs>